Hello everyone and welcome to the chapter 11 lecture for Crowley's An Introduction to Human Disease. This chapter is all about cardiovascular disease, so disease of the heart and somewhat to some extent of the vasculature, the blood vessels that carry blood to and from the heart. So first we have to talk about some anatomy of the heart, the different parts of the heart. So um, the heart is divided into four chambers. The top two chambers here, these little circular chambers, are the atria. And the bottom two chambers, these larger, more triangular shaped ones, are the ventricles. Another thing to note about the heart is it may look like I have mislabeled the right and left side because looking at this picture, um, this is not the right side, but when we are looking at a patient in anatomical view, we are looking at their right and their left. So when you're looking down at a patient, their right is your left and their left is your right. So this in a textbook, we're always drawing the right side of the heart as the patient's heart. So it's on the left side of the page. So the right side of the heart you'll see is full of blue blood, um, and that is just the textbook representation of deoxygenated blood. Deoxygenated blood is not actually blue, though your veins, which carry your deoxygenated blood, do also appear blue in textbooks and also appear blue looking through your skin, but that's actually just um, really a trick of the light that they appear blue. The blood in your veins and in the right side of the heart, the deoxygenated blood is actually like a dark purple, a dark red. It's the color that it is when you get your blood drawn and it gets drawn into a tube. Because um, most blood draws are venous blood draws, so they're getting deoxygenated blood. Uh, aortic blood, um, or arterial blood, oxygenated blood, is a bright red color. So it is redder. Um, and the deoxygenated blood is bluer, but it's a, more like a like a maroon, like a dark red than an actual blue. Um, but in textbooks, we'll always see it as blue. All right, so the right side of the heart, the right atrium and right ventricle contain deoxygenated blood. Left side of the heart contains oxygenated blood. The right side of the heart receives blood from the body. So these major vessels here, the vena cavi, um, the blood comes from the body, deoxygenated, spent, already the oxygen has already been taken by your tissues, and now it's coming back to the heart. And the right side of the heart, when the ventricle pumps, it sends it to the lungs. This is the pulmonary artery, and um, it carries blood away from the heart into the lungs so it can get oxygenated and then come back through the pulmonary vein right here into the left side of the heart. So the left side of the heart is full of freshly oxygenated blood from the lungs, and then the left ventricle is going to pump that oxygenated blood out through the aorta to the body to send oxygen to the body. So it's this circular flow um, that you'll see on the next slide. It's actually sort of two circles. Other parts of the heart that are important to know are the valves. So between each of these chambers and between the chambers and the va and the arteries, um, there is a valve. And the valve is just, it's sort of like, I think of it as, you know, when you get a fountain beverage and it has a lid for a straw and there's some little flaps that allow you to push your straw in, but um, hopefully it doesn't allow for leaking of the stuff out. So the flaps are kind of, they're, they're kind of meant to help prevent flow in two directions and just kind of keep it in one direction. So these valves help to, so the, the blood is supposed to flow from the atria to the ventricles. So the valve opens to allow the blood flow that way and then it closes so that it doesn't flow backwards. So it kind of helps to keep the flow going in the forward direction. Um, so the tricuspid valve is here on the right side of the heart, where the mitral valve is on the left side of the heart, between the left atrium and ventricle. So it would be, these two valves are also called our atrioventricular valves because they separate the atrium and ven the ventricle. You can see in this picture actually these tiny little tendons, these little strings kind of pulling on them. Those tendons are what help them open and close. 
and they're called the Cordy tendony. I don't have it on this slide, but um, it's in your textbook. And um, they are, I think they're funny because um, people talk about, you know, tugging on your heartstrings, which is like a, a metaphor or a saying that, um, but but you do literally have heartstrings. These um, Cordy tendony <clears throat> are literally little string-like tendons in your heart that tug on your valves and pull them open. Um, oh, and then of course there's valves in the great arteries, the aorta and the pulmonary artery here, so that when blood pumps through there, it doesn't slide back into the heart and it keeps going. Um, and I already kind of gave you this information about where the blood flow is coming from and going to. The blood in the right side of the heart is coming from your great from your veins, from your venous flow, and it's coming from your body. So the lower vena cava brings blood from the lower body. The upper vena cava brings blood from the upper body, so arms and head and shoulders. And um, then the left ventricle pumps blood out through the aorta, and there's branches of the aorta up here that send blood to the upper body, and then the aorta kind of folds around the back side of the heart and goes down to feed oxygenated blood to the lower side of the body. So this is the full circulation flow of blood. It is two circles, really. The two cir circulatory pathways are the systemic circulation, so that's circulation to your body, and the pulmonary circulation, the smaller circle here, which is circulation of blood to the heart. So the um, deoxygenated blood comes from the body, from the upper body and from the lower extremities into the right side of the heart where it gets pumped. It, it flows into the right atrium, gets pumped into the right ventricle, then gets pumped out to the lungs where it gets oxygenated, comes back to the heart, into the left atrium, then into the left ventricle, and then the left ventricle will pump it out to the body. If you'll notice in this picture, this is the muscle tissue here, the myocardium that we'll talk about in the next slide. Notice that it is thicker on the surrounding the left ventricle than it is surrounding the right ventricle. And that's because the left ventricle has to pump harder because it has to get blood all the way out to your fingers and toes versus the right ventricle is just sending blood over to the lungs. It's a short distance, so it doesn't need quite as strong of a pump. And so the muscle tissue is much thicker and more developed on the left side of the heart. Um, the pressure on the left side of the heart is higher as well because of that. And so that also, the pressure differences in the left and right side of the heart also help to keep things flowing. Um, the arteries are what we have drawn in red here. Arteries carry oxygenated blood um, to the body, but they actually carry uh, deoxygenated blood to the lungs. Something is an artery if it carries blood away from the heart. And something is a vein if it's carrying blood to the heart. So um, veins usually are blue because most of our veins are our part of our systemic circulation. And so they are blue, carry deoxygenated blood. The exception is the pulmonary vein here, which brings blood to the heart, but it's oxygenated because it's coming from the lungs. So, um, the heart is divided into sort of different tissue layers. Most of the, of the mass of the heart, um, what we think of as the heart tissue, is the musculature part of the heart. So the heart muscle, the part that pumps, um, is called the myocardium. Myo means muscle. So your myocardium is your heart muscle. The inside of your heart, so those chambers, the ventricles and atria, if you were like, we did a Mrs. Frizzle magic school bus ride into the heart and we're like inside a heart chamber and we're looking at the walls around us, all right? They would be smooth. They would have this smooth lining. That's called the endocardium. So just that inner lining of the heart. Um, the walls of the chambers are lined in a tissue called the endocardium. It's a type of epithelial tissue. And 
then the outside of the heart is protected by a double membrane that is filled with fluid. And so the inner part of that membrane is called the pericardium. The outer part is, sorry, they're both called the pericardium, but the inner part is often referred to as the endocardium. Um, nope, <laughs> the inside chamber of the heart is the endocardium. I'm getting all messed up this morning. The epicardium, epi means on top of or outside of, and it is outside of the heart. Pericardium means around. So they are kind of synonymous. They're outside and around the heart. Um, and they're filled with some fluid in between. And that's basically to keep the heart from chafing when it's beating and expanding and contracting. It would have the potential of, if the myocardium was unexposed, it could kind of chafe or rub up against the ribs in the chest cavity. And so um, this membrane just kind of cushions it. The, fluid there. Um, but fluid can fill. can fill. It can build up during inflammation and um, fill this part of the pericardium and it can kind of smother or suffocate the heart a little bit and has to be removed. Um, the extra fluid has to be removed in order to help the heart have enough room to contract properly. If we look at the outside of the heart, the most important first arteries that branch off the great artery, the aorta here, are called the coronary arteries. So although the heart is full of blood, it's got oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood, it can't um, get oxygen from the blood inside it. It's just holding it, but it can't absorb the oxygen. The, the myocardium, um, because of that endocardial layer being kind of a a buffer. And so the myocardium needs oxygen. It needs to be fed with blood and oxygen, just like the rest of your tissues. And so it is. So the um, blood vessels that sort of feed the heart are um, on the outside here. They're called the coronary arteries. And coronary, corono is a medical term that means crown because they encircle the heart like a crown. Um, and these are the vessels that actually bring oxygen to the heart. They're very important and they are the first, the heart is the first thing to get blood from itself. So it pumps, as soon as the, as the blood gets pumped out through the aorta, it comes back through these coronary arteries to the heart and goes out to the rest of the body. Um, when we talk about a lot of cardiovascular disease, the vasculature we get concerned about these coronary arteries and coronary artery disease happens when these arteries get blocked and blood is no longer um, able to reach parts of the heart and therefore oxygen is not able to reach parts of the heart and part of the heart is starving for oxygen. So how does the heart pump? Um, it pumps through a basically electrical contraction of the muscles and um, the heart contractions, skele skeletal muscles in our bodies, like our arms, we move those through conscious um, signals sent from our neurons and our brain to our muscles when we want to move them. They are voluntary. But cardiac contractions are involuntary. They are controlled um, by the autonomic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system in the brain and they automatically sort of send out these electrical signals. So there's bundles of nervous tissue in the heart that are responsible for the heart contracting. So the three most, I guess, important parts, well, four. So there's two nodes, the SA node here, which stands for the sinoatrial node because it's in the atrium, the right atrium here. The AV node, which is the atrioventricular node, because it's right between the atrium and ventricle. And then there's these um, long fibers here called the bundle branches, or sometimes called the bundle of his. And then they branch out into these thin fibers, neur neural fibers, that branch throughout the ventricles, and these are called the Purkinje fibers. And as you can see in this animation, you the first um, wave is the sinoatrial wave uh, lights up. It sends out a signal, which then 
travels down these uh, nerves here that causes the atria to contract. And then it lights up, it triggers the AV node, which sends a signal down through the Purkinje fibers and triggers the ventricles to contract. So your heart contracts in two parts, the atria and then the ventricles. You get this lub dub sound is the classic sound of the heart contracting. Um, each of these nodes sends out its own sort of um, pulsation rate, has its own pulsation rate. So if one fails, the other can take over, but they have different pulsation rates. And so the strongest one, the, the pacemaker of the heart is considered the SA node, but there are sort of these backups, these redundancies, if the SA node fails, the AV node can take over, but um, really the SA node is the most important one. So this process of nerve signal contraction of the atria, nerve signal contraction of the ventricles, um, and all the meanwhile, the blood filling the ventricles and then getting pushed out, that um, period or all of the little processes that take place is known as the cardiac cycle. So the cardiac cycle, it's everything that happens between one heartbeat to the next, from the start of one heartbeat to the start of the next heartbeat. And um, there are electrical things happening that we can measure, and then there are also the physical things happening of what is contracting and what the blood is, where the blood is in the heart. So um, when we talk about diagnostic techniques, we'll talk about an EKG or ECG which measures the um, electric potential of the heart. It measures the electric activity. And um, it has this classic zigzaggy pattern. And each of these parts of the pattern has a name. And it correlates with a specific um, part of the cardiac cycle. So the first part of the cardiac cycle is atrial systole. Systole, by the way, is the medical term for contraction. So when we say atrial systole, we're talking about atrial contraction. So the atria squeeze and blood moves from the atria into each of the ventricles. And that gives rise to the P wave on the EKG. Then the ventricles contract because the signal continues down through the Purkinje fibers and the ventricles contract. They're much bigger. It's a much stronger contraction. So you get this big peak here. It's called the QRS complex. That signifies ventricular contraction. Then, um, or ventricular systole, if I want to be really, really correct there. Then um, there's this sort of relaxation for a second where the um, ventricles refill just through like gravity, um, not through contraction, but they're just filling. And so this refilling of the atria and then a little bit of the ventricles here through the dripping, that is, um, gives rise to the T wave. And this is when the neurons are all repolarizing to get ready for the next contraction. So um, to look at this little green bar down here, we have um, atrial systole, so the atria contracts, then ventricle systole, the, ventria, ventri the ventricles contract, and then followed each of these, the atria and the ventricle after their contraction, have a period of diastole. Diastole is rest. So it's systole, diastole, systole, diastole, so on and so forth. And that's how blood continues to be pumped around your body. So some terms surrounding the, I guess, volume of the blood that's getting pumped. Um, so for the heart to do its job, the cardiac output, the amount of blood, of oxygenated blood that it pumps to your body needs to be sufficient to meet your um, oxygen needs of your body. And sometimes it's not, and it usually is because of one of these things. So things that help your heart pump appropriate amounts of oxygenated blood to your body include um, the stroke volume. So the stroke volume is how much blood um, the ventricle is actually pumping out. And you can imagine that if the ventricle doesn't fill properly, it won't pump enough blood. If the ventricle is too small because of the shape of your heart or because of hyper hypertrophy, overdevelopment of the muscle tissue here, 
then it's not going to be able to pump up out enough volume of blood. Um, or if the heart is very weak and it's not pumping, the ventricle's not pumping hard enough, it's just weakly pumping, it's not going to get enough blood out. So that stroke volume is important, and there's a lot of things that affect stroke volume, like um, the filling time, so how much time it takes to fill, uh, whether you have um, your blood pressure, your vasodilation, vasoconstriction, and some of the other things that I was talking about. So there's a lot of things that affect the stroke volume. To compensate for a low stroke volume, what your heart can do is it can increase the heart rate. So the heart rate is how many times it pumps in a minute. And um, so your cardiac output, it's the, the formula for it is it's the heart rate times the stroke volume. If you have a low stroke volume, your heart rate will go up in order to maintain your cardiac output. If you have a high stroke volume, you can have a lower heart rate and still be able to put out cardiac output. Generally, a low heart rate is a sign of good health, is a sign of a strong, healthy heart and a good stroke volume that your heart doesn't need to pump um, very often in order to meet the oxygen needs of your body. Um, athletes, people who have a lot of cardiovascular fitness, tend to have lower heart rates, like in the 40s or 50s, versus someone who has a sedentary lifestyle, like myself, um, in like the 70s or 80s. And, um, but that is per individual as well. So somebody who normally has a heart rate of um, 70 or 80, if their heart rate goes down unexpectedly, that's not necessarily healthy. So um, changes in heart rate are, are a sign of an issue that something is not normal. And that's sort of the definition of disease. But um, different people will have different heart rates based on the health of their myocardium, of their heart, and other a uh, number of other factors that affect their uh, stroke volume. So those are some, I guess, important terms there. Um, we can another thing that we can measure about the heart's pumping is we can measure blood pressure. So when the heart contracts in systole, the blood is pumped into the arteries and that increases the pressure in the arteries. It pushes against the arterial walls. And then when the blood stops flowing through there during diastole, that period of rest, there's less pressure. And so we, we measure both, we can measure the pressure during both of those periods during systole and during diastole. And so when we measure blood pressure, we are getting two different readings. The first reading is the systolic blood pressure, and it's the higher number because that's the pressure during contraction. And then the second number is the diastolic blood pressure, the pressure during relaxation. And they tell us different things. So the systolic blood pressure tells us um, like how hard the heart is pumping. Um, so a, a very high systolic blood pressure can uh, give us information about the sort of quality of systole um, versus a high diastolic blood pressure. Um, part of the diastolic blood pressure depends on the elasticity of your arteries. So arteries should be elastic, able to sort of stretch, um, contract and relax a little bit in response to the changing pressure. But um, over time or with different diet and hormone exposure, arteries can kind of become stiff and hardened and then they don't expand as much. And so the diastolic blood pressure goes up. It also affects systolic blood pressure. But um, so your blood pressure depends on a few things. It's a, it's a measure of how hard your heart is pumping, but also a measure of the elasticity of your blood vessels. Um, and the health of your vasculature. Um, blood vessels should be elastic. If they're elastic, then it also helps to regulate and keep a healthy blood pressure. If they become stiff or your blood pressure is chronically high, that puts a lot of strain on your blood vessels, which can lead to rupture, can lead to 
inflammation that leads to plaque buildup. So high blood pressure is a chronic health issue that can over time damage your blood vessels and your blood vessels are very important to bring oxygen to different tissues. So depending on which blood vessels in your body are getting damaged, it can also lead to organ damage in those in important organs. So um, it's something to take care of to prevent it from reaching that stage. Some diagnostic tools in cardiology, the two most common ones to look at the heart function is the electrocardiogram, which is sometimes called an ECG and sometimes called an EKG. And I don't quote me on this, but I think it had to do with a language thing. Like I think in German, electrocardiogram is spelled with a K and in English it's with a C. And so that's why we have the different um, letters, but they're the same exact thing. So um, it's a procedure where a machine with different electrode leads are attached to different parts of the chest in order to read the electrical output at different parts of the heart, on different parts of the heart. And you just kind of sit there and it measures these electrical impulses and you get this readout, this chart here. Um, where we see that P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. So those that's a, a healthy um, rhythm, heart rhythm. So this is a diagnostic tool to look at problems with the conduction system, with the nerves that are sending out the electrical impulses that control the heart beat. Um, it does not tell us anything about heart structure or function otherwise, specifically looking at electrical output. Um, an echocardiogram is a, uh, an echo, echo means like sound waves. It's a type of sonogram or um, uh, ultrasound, okay? It's using an ultrasound machine to look at the heart. And we can also see the blood pumping, so you can see the flow. Um, so it, you can actually see it like the filling time, look at, look at a little bit of the stroke volume can be measured, the volume of the chambers can be measured in ultrasound, um, and it's a non-invasive procedure, it's not radioactive, so it's pretty popular to look at different structures in the heart, the valves, to make sure the valves are opening and closing properly. Um, so if there are no electrical issues with the heart, then you'll be sent for the echocardiogram to look for structural issues. Uh, a lot of times they'll do both to just cover all their bases. Um, so yeah. So interesting thing about cardiac development. So in utero, when a fetus is inside the uterus, all right, they are um, getting blood through the placenta from their mother. And so there's, their lungs are not functional yet. They're not breathing. So they don't really need that pulmonary circulation. They are not oxygenating their cells the same way that they are once they are born and they start breathing with their lungs. So there are some um, uh, specific structural differences in the fetus and the fetal circulation that allows for it to get oxygen from the mother. So if this is the placenta. Here's the umbilical cord. The red part of the umbilical cord is the artery, the umbilical artery here that's going to, uh, that's bringing blood to the heart, um, the fetal heart. The fetal heart has some holes in it. It's got this hole, a hole here in the atria called the foramen ovale, and it allows for blood in the right and left sides of the heart to mix. And so in an adult heart and even a newborn heart, as soon as they're born, that actually will close and separates the two sides of the heart. They're divided by this septum here. That's a word I forgot to tell you. The central wall here is called the septum. Um, in the fetal heart, there's that hole that kind of bypasses the septum and allows the, the blood to mix. Um, and so all the blood is kind of a mixture of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood and it gets pumped through the body. It gets pumped to the lungs, but the lungs aren't functional. They're, they, it goes out and comes back with no more oxygen than it had before. And then it can circulate to the fetal body and then the, the fetal body brings the deoxygenated blood back to the heart and it goes um, back through the 
uh, umbilical veins here, these purple guys, um, and goes back into the mother's blood. So the maternal circulation can then oxygenate it and so on and so forth. So um, another sort of passageway that um, bypasses the separation of the arterial and venal flow is this part right here. This is called the ductus arteriosus, and it's basically a fusion between the pulmonary vein and the aorta. So um, it kind of means that the fetus is really not passing much blood through the pulmonary circulation. It's a way to kind of bypass that useless pulmonary circulation um, while they are in utero and not actually breathing through their lungs. As soon as they are born though, the lungs expand and the pressure of that expansion actually helps to close the foramen ovale. So the act of taking their first breath actually puts pressure on this system in their heart and closes these different openings that were open in utero. So it happens immediately upon breathing, which is why we can cut the umbilical cord and they can start oxygenating their own blood through their lungs. What can happen, a lot of congenital heart defects that we'll talk about, um, a lot of them are due to failures of these features to close um, and or to close all the way. And so it leads to not fully oxygenated blood uh, circulating through the system. So there's sort of two categories of these congenital heart defects, defects that babies are born with. Um, and they are, uh, have to do with which way the blood is shunted. Okay, so if we kind of go back to this picture on the previous slide, um, the foramen ovale allows blood to kind of flow freely and equally between the right and left atria. Once the baby is born and the system becomes more pressurized um, by the lungs, the flow can either be in one direction or the other. So it'll either be left to right or right to left. Now, if it's left to right, it's not that big of a deal because the blood on the left is going, let's go back to that picture here. So if the blood on the left, this oxygenated part, this some of this oxygenated blood, is going into the right side of the heart. It's going to get pumped to the lungs and then it'll get pumped to the body again. So it's just kind of double oxygenating, but you're still pumping oxygenated blood to the body. So um, in the left to right shunt, <clears throat> there's a mixture of blood going to the lungs, but all of the blood going to the body is fully oxygenated. The problem is when you have a right to left shunt, because in the right to left shunt, when if deoxygenated blood is bleeding over into the left part, then it means you're pumping deoxygenated blood to the body. You're pumping sort of mixed blood to the body, which is not ideal. So you're not going to be getting enough oxygen to your tissues. And so these right to left shunts are more problematic. Um, in terms of newborns, we call them acyanotic uh, congenital heart defects and cyanotic congenital heart defects. Cyanosis is a condition of bluing, used typically of the hands and feet, but it can be sort of the whole, the whole baby. And it's normal in the first few minutes of life as the baby's taking its first breath and the umbilical circulation's cutting down and they're relying on their own circulation. Um, but if it persists beyond that, that's a sign of a congenital heart defect and needs to be remedied. So right to left shunts are more problematic because they result in deoxygenated blood getting pumped to the body, and um, which potentially leaves the tissues not having enough oxygen and results in this bluing effect. There are many different causes of congenital heart defects. Um, Infections, various infections, uh, cytomegalovirus being one, can lead, and rubella, um, which hopefully is pretty rare now because of the vaccine. Uh, those are conditions that can lead to um, congenital heart defects, uh, malformations of development of the heart in utero due to the infection. It could be due to a genetic issue that causes uh, 
the heart to not form properly. Um, it can be iatrogenic due to certain medications or vaccines. And lastly, it and the most common reason for congenital heart defects is they are idiopathic. We just don't know. They just just didn't develop. The heart didn't develop quite right, and we're not really exactly sure why, but hopefully it's fixable. So some common acyanotic congenital heart defects that are shown here. Um, this one is called coarctation of the aorta. So here's the aorta coming out of the heart and on the back side of the aorta there's this constriction or stenosis, this narrowing here, which makes it, you know, if you think, think of a straw, if you pinch the straw or a hose and you pinch it, um, it it's going to increase the pressure coming through and decrease the volume somewhat. So it can lead to very high blood pressure and can be very damaging to the vasculature if it's not remedied. But oxygenated blood still gets to the extremities, so it's not cyanotic. Um, a patent ductus arteriosus. So remember those two features of the fetal heart? There was the ductus arteriosus, which is a gap, an opening between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And there's the foramen ovale, that hole that connects the two atria together. So um, patent means open. So normally when the baby takes their first breath, those things close, they're supposed to close. So here's the ductus arteriosus, becomes this little shriveled <clears throat> Thing here that's no longer um, open, but in the case where it still remains open, it's called the patent ductus arteriosus, and you can see mixed blood going into the pulmonary circulation. Um, some of the arterial blood that's being pumped through the aorta ends up bleeding back into the pulmonary circulation, so not ideal. And sometimes that fixes itself over time but sometimes it needs to be surgically corrected. Um, another type of defect is a septal defect, so either a defect in the septum, the wall that connects the atria, or separates the atria, or a ventricular septal defect, a defect, an opening in the wall that's supposed to separate the ventricles. So um, in the case of the opening in the wall of the atrium, Blood mixes in the atria since the pressure on the right side of the heart is greater. It's a higher pressure here. The blood ends up flowing preferentially from the left to the right. And again, of course, uh, left to right is not as big of a deal. Um, it just means that we have some, some blood getting oxygenated twice because some of the oxygenated blood will bleed over here and then get sent back to the lungs. This is also what happens this is basically the same thing that happens if there's a patent foramen ovale. So if the hole that connects these two is still open, it'll be the same kind of, of bleed over effect. Um, and then this septal defect here, the ventricular septal defect, similarly, the blood instead bleeds from the, from the left ventricle over into the right ventricle. So you have mixed blood going through the pulmonary circulation. Um, small septal defects oftentimes will heal on their own. Um, the tissue will connect and uh, fuse together, but larger septal defects have to be surgically fixed. The more serious types of congenital heart defects are the cyanotic ones, the ones that result in bluing because they result in deoxygenated blood going out to the body. And the two biggest ones are called Tetralogy of Fallot and Transposition of the Great Artery. So the Tetralogy of Fallot, tetra, means four. Basically, this is a heart that has four, um, these, these classic four different defects going on all at once. So the first one is the um, right ventricle hypertrophy. So remember, the left side of the heart is, the muscle is thicker there than on the right side of the heart. And, but in Tetralogy of Fallot, the left, the right side of the heart um, is, is thickened and is thicker than the left side, which is not the right way to be. <laughs> there's also a ventricular septal defect. So there's a hole in the wall of, 
between that separates the ventricles that allows for mixing of blood. There's also pulmonary stenosis, a narrowing of the pulmonary um, artery, so blood is not pumped as efficiently to the lungs to get oxygenated. And in order to try to compensate for all that, the aorta is widened and actually like, so then it, it's kind of on both sides of the heart. So instead of the aorta just receiving blood from the left side, it's actually both ventricles are sort of pumping into the aorta. Um, and so a mixture of, of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood is going out to the body. So that has to be surgically corrected. And then this one definitely has to be surgically corrected or it will result in death very quickly, the transposition of the great artery. So this is a condition where the arteries swap places. So instead of the aorta coming um, attached to the left ventricle, it is attached to the right ventricle. And the pulmonary artery, instead of being attached to the right atria, it's attached to the left atria. And so oxygenated blood gets pumped to the heart, or sorry, to the lungs, and deoxygenated blood gets pumped to the body. So it's totally wrong. It's just flipped. Um, the blood is going in the wrong directions. And so um, these have to be cut and re-anastomosed, um, um, connected uh, to the correct chamber of the heart because it will not result in appropriate oxygenation. You just will end up with a circle of oxygenated blood and a circle of deoxygenated blood and nothing is getting oxygenated to the body. So now those are all congenital diseases, diseases that babies might be born with um, from their hearts not developing quite properly. And those are generally remedied in infancy, either on their own, They're, they can either heal on their own or through surgical means. Um, myocardial diseases, these are now diseases of the heart muscle. Coffee break. So myocarditis, remember that suffix itis means inflammation or infection. So inflammation can be due to infection. So different viruses can lead to myocarditis. One is SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 can cause myocarditis. Also, the vaccine for COVID-19 can, in some cases, cause some mild myocarditis. Not nearly as bad as the virus itself can, though. Um, other drugs, um, pharmaceuticals, might also have side effects of causing inflammation of the heart. And there are also a number of autoimmune disorders that can lead to inflammation of the heart. The uh, most important one um, that is sort of stems from infection and autoimmunity combined is um, from something called rheumatic fever. So rheumatic fever is, is very rare now because um, it's caused by uh, a strange reaction the body has to strep, streptococcus bacteria. So you get streptococcus, strep throat, right? And when you get strep throat, nowadays you go and you get some antibiotics, it treats the strep and the strep goes away. Um, if you didn't treat it, it might go away on its own but it also could progress to um, rheumatic fever. So what happens is when the body is exposed to strep bacteria, especially if it's fighting it for a long time, um, it can produce antibodies that towards the streptococcus bacteria. The strep, strep bacteria has a, an antigen, a protein, that looks a lot like a protein that's also found on our heart. And so, um, in mounting an immune response towards streptococcus, you can also end up making antibodies that recognize your heart tissue. And so that's a form of autoimmune disease because your immune system creates antibodies that attack the heart and cause myocarditis. And that's what rheumatic fever is. It's sort of a, what we call a sequelae. It's um, a disease that can happen after strep infection. That is, it's an autoimmune disease that can be triggered by strep infection. And being able to treat strep with antibiotics has gone a long way to preventing that. Um, but it used to be much, much more prevalent before antibiotics. So 
some of the signs and symptoms of myocarditis, um, an irregular heart rhythm due to that inflammation, chest pain due to the inflammation, and shortness of breath because of lack of efficient oxygenation because of the heart not beating properly. Um, so this is just another picture sort of uh, looking at the tissue of a normal heart versus one with myocarditis where it's inflamed, it's thickened, it's um, angry from all the cytokines that the immune cells, so it's a heart, normal heart muscle doesn't have a lot of immune cells in there, um, but when it's inflamed, um, there's lots of T cells and B cells and they are, and other types of white blood cells and they're secreting histamine and other cytokines that lead to the swelling um, and pain that's associated with myocarditis. So a lot of myo some mild myocarditis can um, be self-limiting, meaning it heals itself, it gets better on its own, doesn't really require any treatment, but just, you know, not straining the heart, so getting rest and allowing it to heal. Um, sometimes there are medications, sometimes the myocarditis can be severe and it can lead to a myocardial infarction, heart attack, um, and in that case it can be fatal. And, um, all right, so cardiomyopathy, another category of disease, and the two main class, technically cardiomyopathy just means disease of the heart. So myocarditis is technically a type of cardiomyopathy. Um, but in cardiology, the two big diagnoses that involve this word are dilated cardiomyopathy, or DCM. Uh, we'll write that. This is often abbreviated DCM for dilated cardiomyopathy. And this one is abbreviated HCM for hypotrophic, hypertrophic, sorry, cardiomyopathy. So in dilated cardiomyopathy, dilation means widening. So there's a widening or dilation of the left ventricle <clears throat> and oftentimes a weakening of the myocardium around it. So it's wider, bigger, which means it should have a, a higher stroke volume, but that dilation actually weakens it. It's a, it's a sign of the muscle on that side being very weak. And so it's only pumping like this a little bit. So even though there's a large volume, not a lot of blood is getting out. And you can kind of see that in the size of the arrows here, showing healthy amount of stroke volume versus in the dilated cardiomyopathy, the stroke volume is reduced. Um, and same thing with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There's an overdevelopment, um, excessive thickening of the wall here, which means it should pump really hard, but the ventricle's so small that even the, the amount that it's pumping is very small. So both of these situations end up reducing the stroke volume, the volume of oxygenated blood that's pumped out, which then results usually in an increased heart rate to try to make up for that, to try to improve the cardiac output. And um, most muscles in your body, you know, working them out more is a good thing. It makes them stronger. But in the case of the heart, if it's working harder, it generally exhausts itself. So um, these conditions that make the heart pump faster and work harder um, end up tiring out the heart um, and can lead to heart failure. Uh, diseases of the valves in the heart. So um, those valves help things to flow in one direction, but valves age over time. And we see this like in plumbing as well. Um, the valves are doing a lot of work. Uh, there's no way around that. And over time and exposed to different hormones and, and chemicals in the body, they can just become worn and worn out. And um, so valves normally, when they open, they look like this. And when they're closed, they look like this, just like the straw hole in the fountain beverage, right? Um, and so they're supposed to open and close, open and close. Well, if they become very calcified, then they get to a point where they can't open properly. And this is as much as they can open. That's called stenosis. Stenosis is a narrowing. And in this case, they can't open properly. They're too narrow. 
And then um, another problem that can happen is the flaps can just get kind of worn away so that they don't close properly. They never really close properly. And that can lead to regurgitation or backflow. And so um, these are two problems that can affect the efficiency of blood flowing through the heart and um, often need to be fixed. So they can be fixed one of two ways. They, well, they, they can be fixed surgically by replacing the valve. Sometimes the valve can be repaired, but usually it's replaced. And the two types of replacement valves are mechanical valves, which are synthetic materials, um, and or a biological valve. So either a valve from a cadaver or from an animal like a pig or a cow, uh, made of pig or cow tissue. So the mechanical valves, the, they're more, dur more durable, they last longer um, because biological valves, our natural biological valves and um, artificial biological valves, they do wear, they um, acquire wear and tear over time. So biological valves will last usually around 10 or 15 years before they need to be replaced again. Um, vers versus the mechanical valves, which can last longer than that. The mechanical valves though have additional risks as well. They increase the risk of blood clotting. So blood clots will kind of stick there. It, it, it's a better, I guess the biological valve you can think of as like a smoother surface that blood and platelets don't stick to, but they do stick better to these replacement valves so they can form clots that then cause blockages or break off and cause like a stroke or a heart attack. So um, that's the downside of the mechanical ones. Also the mechanical ones have to be open heart surgically inserted. So the chest has to be open, the heart has to be open in order to insert them. The biological valves can oftentimes be inserted through a um, catheter where they feed um, something through the heart through one of the big vessels like uh, the femoral artery in, in the leg. So basically they go through the leg and feed it up through the artery in the leg to the heart. And so it's not open heart surgery, it is heart surgery, but it's not um, they don't have to open the chest and open the heart up, so it's much less invasive and safer in that sense. So, <clears throat> um, some myocardial diseases, uh, additional myocardial diseases. This is, so before we were talking about, um, actually this is technically not a myocardial disease, because we were talking about diseases that affect the myocardium, the muscle tissue. This endocarditis is um, inflammation inside the heart, um, kind of along with the valvular disease. So it's when there's bacterial infection inside the heart. Now the walls of the chambers, the endocardium itself is very smooth and tends not to be a surface that bacteria and things can stick to. But the valves and the, and the cordy tendony, those heart strings, okay, they are a bit rougher of a material and um, bacteria and yeast and microbes and stuff can stick there and grow. And when that happens, it's, it's a localized infection and these, um, these films of microbial growth are called vegetations. Um, and it happens when bacteria gets into the bloodstream, which can happen any number of ways. It can happen through a cut or a surgical incision. Bacteria can be introduced. It can happen, a common way that it happens is actually through dental surgery. So when you have dental surgery, uh, bacteria from the mouth can get into the vasculature and some of them happen to like landing on heart valves and can lead to endocarditis. So it's why a lot of times before oral surgery, you are put on antibiotics to prevent that from happening, to, to try to kill the bacteria before they can get into the bloodstream, reduce the amount of bacteria that get into the bloodstream during the surgery. Another population that's at high risk for endocarditis are intravenous drug users. Um, using unsterilized needles or not sterilizing their skin and then skin microbes entering the circulation through injection. Um, endocarditis can oftentimes, since it's a bacterial infection, can be treated with antibiotics, 
but sometimes the vegetations are so large and thick that they are not the antibiotics just can't touch them um, so sometimes they do have to be surgery is involved and also death can be involved um, now for some diseases that involve the conduction the electrical conduction system of the heart being the root cause so remember in a normal heart rhythm this is a normal regular heartbeat we've got our typical ekg reading here where uh, an impulse comes from the sa node it travels through the atria causes atrial contraction then hits the av node which then uh, sends the signal down the um, purkinje fibers into the ventricles and then the ventricles contract okay so that's normal um, it's like a single contraction of the atria and a single contraction of the ventricle because these are coordinated nerve impulses. Um, what happens in fibrillation is the nerve impulses are not, it's not a single pulse, it's like multiple little pulses. I kind of think of it as a seizure of the heart. So a seizure, a brain seizure, is when um, electrical impulses in the brain are kind of going off not in a coordinated fashion and in the heart it's due fibrillation is due to uncoordinated nerve impulses there and so instead of getting a single strong contraction instead you're getting like this like fluttering of the chambers instead of pushing they're just going like this which is ineffective at actually moving blood along so atrial fibrillation um, does result in less effective oxygenation, but it's the ventricle pumping that um, pumps blood out to the body. So as long as the ventricles are still pumping properly, you're still getting pretty good oxygenation. So there are signs, I mean, atrial fibrillation, you might feel that sensation um, a little bit, that irregular heartbeat, you might have fatigue because you're not getting quite as well oxygenated, and it will for sure show up on a um, EKG that you have less of that P wave right before the QRS peak, all right, and that the heartbeat is not regular. It's kind of the all over the place in terms of its rhythm, right? There are drugs. Um, to treat AFib that help to regulate that contraction, right? I like the way the book talked about ventricular fibrillation, though. It said, um, the term it used, it said, VFib is incompatible with life because if your ventricle is fibrillating, okay, then it's not pumping blood to the body. So um, ventricle, ventricular fibrillation will very quickly result in passing out and needs to be treated very quickly because you are you are not getting blood oxygenating your body. So um, common cause of heart attack um, is ventricular fibrillation. And it looks something like this on an EKG. It's just a hot mess because all of those clean QRS peaks are gone. And it's just this that the heart is doing. And so um, defibrillators are the way to treat ventricular fibrillation. When somebody has a heart attack, um, the best, most effective treatment is usually due to ventricular fibrillation, and the best way to fix ventricular fibrillation is with those, uh, with an electronic shock, an electric shock that basically disrupts that um, quivering and sort of resets the node so that it's sending out regular signals again. Um, other types, there's other types of uh, issues with the sinus node, the sinoatrial node that can be fixed with a pacemaker. And in inserting a pacemaker, it's basically like having your own personal little AED that um, can measure the electrical impulses of the heart. And if they're irregular, to send out its own electrical impulse to prevent these fibrillation events from happening. Another serious type of cardiovascular disease is known as coronary artery disease. Um, you can also have peripheral artery disease. 
So this, these arterial diseases affect the arteries and you start getting a buildup. It's when you get a buildup of plaque in the artery. So the artery should be nice and smooth so blood can flow through it and flow through that full you know, volume of the lumen. Um, but exposure to different things can lead to inflammation that kind of hardens the wall of the artery and then lipids flowing through the blood that are just part of your diet and your uh, every day start sticking to the walls and then um, calcium reacts with them and causes 